1130, so I'll go ahead and, um, and welcome everyone in. Um, thank you all for logging in to attend uh, this first ever uh, virtual panel discussion hosted by the SSPC Gulf Coast Chapter. Um, my name is Joseph Canode. I work for Barton International Garnet Abrasives, and I am the co-chair for the SSPC Gulf Coast Chapter. Um, we have a great event planned today. Um, our virtual panel panelists um, are here. They're industry leaders. Uh, they're here to answer questions from our moderator, Jim Kunkel, with SSPC, um, and uh, also give us some, some honest perspective of the uh, economic status of the oil and gas industry and uh, the effects from COVID-19, um, the pandemic. Um, the mission of, of the SSPC Gulf Coast chapter is to educate and encourage and to assist in raising the quality of knowledge, training, and workmanship in the ever-evolving surface preparation and protective coatings industry. Um, due to the pandemic, the SSPC Gulf Ch Coast chapter unfortunately has to, had to cancel all in-person events, um, our golf tournament and our painters competition. Um, we were bummed to have to cancel that, but in lieu of that, we, we decided to have a couple of events so we could um, award scholarships like we normally do at both of those events. Um, so uh, today and uh, in November at our virtual trade show, we will be awarding a uh, scholarship to, uh, to those who, who would benefit. Um, we're all looking forward to the trade show in November. We'll tell you a little bit about that later on today. Um, but it'll be interesting, and we're all looking forward to it. Um, today, audience members will see a pop-up um, survey um, questionnaire. Very simple questions, um, yes or no answers, or you can even type maybe, I think, or click on maybe um, for, the, for the questionnaires that are going to pop up. Um, the, one of the questions will be uh, if you would benefit from a SSPC scholarship. If you answer yes, you'll automatically be entered in in the random drawing for the scholarship um, that we'll award at the end of this panel discussion. And we'll announce that winner at our November trade show. Um, so uh, you got a, a chance to win something today just for logging in. So thank you very much. Um, one more housekeeping rule. Um, we have everyone on mute just to kind of keep our schedule, keep things moving along. Um, if you have any questions, there's a chat box down at the bottom left corner. Um, I noticed some, some of you have already uh, noticed it. Um, if you have any you know, questions or need any uh, clarifications from any of our panelists, please don't hesitate to type it in. We'll try our best to get to everything. Um, we have a lot of questions, uh, good, good uh, back and forth uh, questions for all of our panelists. So uh, we'll try to get to everything that we, we can. Um, and lastly, before I turn things over to our moderator, the following individuals should be recognized for their extraordinary efforts in getting uh, this thing off the ground um, and making this thing happen today. Uh, Matthew Riley, who's with Carlisle Fluid Technologies, he's our current chair of the SSPC Gulf Coast chapter. He was a driving force behind this event. Um, Jim Kunkel, who is the manager of business development with SSPC Corporate, he's gonna be our moderator today. Um, Eli um, Macareg, um, I, I practiced that a little bit before our uh, meeting here. Uh, he is with Bullard, and uh, who was our platinum sponsor, our, our Zoom sponsor for today. Um, and he's been the technological driving force for this event. Um, Claire, Kara Blizwick, um, she's the membership service coordinator um, with SSPC. Um, Travis Crotwell with, service, uh, uh, with Sherwin Williams. He's our current membership development um, for SSPC Gulf Coast chapter. And then Josh Gray with Elcometer. He's our current recorder for SSPC. And Richard Broussard, who is our treasurer for SSPC Gulf Coast Chapter. Um, and then to all the volunteer panelists, um, thank you all in advance for your uh, honest opinions and your perspectives today. And then lastly, to you, the audience members, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here and being a part of this um, first event. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Um, we'll start off, um, it's my pleasure to present our first panelist, Ms. Wells Bullard, who is the president and CEO of Bullard. So take it away, Wells. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, so I am Wells Bullard from Bullard, and we are a 122-year-old family-owned, I'm the fifth generation, uh, safety equipment manufacturer. 
So we protect workers in hazardous environments around the world with our fire helmets, our thermal imaging cameras, our respiratory protection, and our hard hats and face protection. So my great grandfather actually invented the first industrial hard hat over 100 years ago. And he also invented our first abrasive blast respirator during the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge, which is about 90 years ago. And so we've been proudly protecting the surface preparation and coatings uh, industry ever since. So very glad to be here. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Kristen Leonard with ExxonMobil Research Engineering Downstream Organization. I've been in the industry for just shy of 13 years within the oil and gas non-metallics realm and um, have been for my day-to-day -day roles with ExxonMobil. I cover all of the non-metallic materials for our downstream sites and projects. And that covers um, not only coatings, but also fireproofing, insulation, and uh, elastomers. Good morning, my name is Tyler Abadie. I'm a professional engineer here in New Orleans and the founder and CEO of Abadie Williams. We're a 40 person engineering consulting firm servicing the midstream industry. Uh, our primary assets that we work on are storage terminals, pipelines, deep water ports, and offshore assets. And we've been responsible for about $700 million in acquisitions and divestments from major oil companies like ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, to independents and MLPs throughout the United States. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Vince Deese. I work with Loop LLC. Um, my corporate office is in Covington, Louisiana. We have multiple locations. Uh, south of there. Uh, I am the corrosion engineer at Loop. My responsibilities include the, include the soil side corrosion, internal corrosion, as well as atmospheric corrosion. Uh, we have a lot of facilities, uh, assets that are above ground and require coding. So I'm in charge of that maintenance program. Good morning. My name is Luis Garfias. I am a material scientist and I have 30 years of experience working in the oil and gas business. Most of my work is uh, related to materials, uh, on-site uh, materials selection and materials uh, troubleshooting, failure analysis, um, and uh, lab work, which is basically in the area of oil and gas for high temperature, high pressure, in aggressive environments and corrosion. I, have been, I haven't been with SSPC, but uh, now that the SSPC and NACE has joined, um, I have been in NACE for 30 years and the Electrochemical Society for 30 years. So my experience on oil and gas is basically in the area of materials and testing. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning. I'd like to thank the Gulf Coast section of SSPC for the invitation. My name's Drew Headley. I work for Kinder Morgan. I'm the manager of corrosion control for our natural gas business unit. Uh, we've got 10 corrosion engineers, and our role is to support the field operations in corrosion control with, for example, specifications for painting and underground coating, internal coatings and linings. Um, uh, I, I really come from the NACE side. I, I was chair of the NACE TCC, which oversaw all of uh, NACE's uh, technical activities, uh, but I am a, a member of SSBC, and I'm looking forward to the the uh, synergies that are going to come from joining together the coding society with with uh, corrosion society. Alan, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I'm Alan Knight. I'm with uh, Marlin Services. We're a coatings contractor based out of Houma, Louisiana. We, uh, we, uh, we have some offshore crews. We do FBE coatings, underground piping. We support, support a lot of midstream uh, activities, um, both in the coastal areas uh, and, and inland. Um, we also do uh, do internal and external tanks, so we provide a we provide a lot of the application services for uh, coatings. 
Hi, I'm Dan McManus, uh, president of American Hydro Test here in Deer Park, Texas, and uh, we service, refurbish as a DOT requalification center, uh, gas cylinders, so refrigerant cylinders, low pressure, recovery tanks, things like that, and on the high pressure side, breathing air, nitrogen, argon, medical oxygen, and, um, uh, and other high pressure uh, cylinders and trailers and racks. Thank you. My name is Bill Nelson. I'm a vice president at Axiom Manufacturing. We are the manufacturers, the owners and manufacturers of the Schmidt brand of abrasive blasting equipment. Um, I'm heavily involved in product development um, as well as uh, field service work should it be required. Uh, I've been in the same facility now uh, involved with the Schmidt line for a little over 30 years. So there's a, a, a little bit of history that, that comes along and I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to partake as a panelist in this event. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Yi. I'm the CEO of RT Consults, uh, which is a third party inspection company for industrial linings, uh, offshore industry coatings, um, fiberglass, thermoplastics, uh, kind of inspections. Uh, we basically, uh, for myself, I'm basically a chairman for several committees at NACE and currently sit as the Standards Committee 09 Non-Metallics Chairman. And um, yeah, so we basically service a lot of these uh, chemical plants, offshore industry, onshore facilities, and then the pulp and paper and different types of specialty chemical markets. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. No matter where you're at from the world, we appreciate having you here with us today. I'll be the moderator for this panel. My name is Jim Kunkel. I'm a business development manager with SSPC, the Society for Protective Coatings. Let's go ahead and get into the panel discussion. And I'm gonna open up with uh, Wells. Wells, on, on behalf of the SSPC Gulf Coast chapter, thank you for participating on this industry panel and, and to Bullard for providing the virtual platform for today's panel discussion. Uh, on the current economic state of the uh, oil and gas industry, plus the impact of COVID-19. Let me open this panel discussion on what 2020 will be remembered for, which is COVID-19. Bullard has been on the front line providing many industries protective, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, much of it for the protection of frontline workers. How, my question to you is how has Bullard responded to COVID-19? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, yes, it's been a wild, a wild year, right? Uh, so Bullard, uh, for those of you guys who understand us, we, we make personal protective equipment. So we've been talking about PPE for over 100 years, and all of a sudden, the whole world is talking about PPE um, as a result of this pandemic. And so it's been really interesting. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in terms of how we responded. The first case in Kentucky was actually in our really small community where we manufacture uh, in Cynthiana. And so all of a sudden on March 6th, uh, this became really real to us in the United States. Prior to that, our Asia Pacific and European teams had been feeling this and, and obviously responding in different ways. Uh, so uh, yeah, so ever since then, we basically changed kind of everything that we do. So how we manufacture, uh, we all of a sudden had to uh, socially distanced, we had to wash our hands, we had to, uh, we ultimately implemented masks, we have different uh, spacing of where workers are basically every single day for a few weeks there. Uh, the manufacturing environment was different every time our employees came in. But again, we protect workers in hazardous environments. And in order to do so, we had to focus first and foremost on keeping our own employees healthy and safe so that they could come to work and work safely in order to make the life-saving equipment that was being used on the front lines. Um, so some of our powered air purifying respirators um, were being used on the front lines in hospitals, uh, in, uh, in different places with frontline workers. But we also protect, basically everyone that we protect is an essential critical worker. So again, people working uh, on utilities and people working in refineries, I mean, they were all critical essential workers and first responders. And so we really, uh, 
we had a really high demand for a lot of our products. Uh, and so our operations team did an incredible job of mobilizing while changing their processes basically every single uh, day based on new information from the CDC and stuff. Uh, we were able to increase our capacity a great deal. And we partnered with, uh, with different people in order to help us make that happen. Um, so again, we've been really focused on keeping our team as healthy and safe as possible so that we can protect people around the world. Uh, but there's been a whole lot of effort in that. Uh, we even launched a brand new product, a healthcare face shield in a matter of weeks versus months. And if you can imagine, our team was really uh, motivated because again, we're very mission driven on how to protect workers. Uh, but our suppliers were really mission driven on that too. And so people were able to respond in, in incredibly short time periods in order to try to meet the needs of of the frontline workers and other critical essential workers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, uh, go to uh, Dan. You know, 2020 has been such a, a crazy year, especially for the oil and gas uh, industry. How have you adjusted to current oil industry market conditions, Dan? Well, our adjustment has been dramatic. Uh, so we live and die off a of turnaround business. And that's in those seasons, those uh, two predominant seasons in the Gulf Coast. And uh, so when that the spring canceled, spring season was essentially canceled, uh, we really had to do a lot of uh, quick ad adjustments. So we, uh, we started new email campaigns and uh, segments of new business, expanding our reach uh, from just local to regional, even national in some areas, and uh, really... Um, putting a focus on other markets outside of just the oil and gas. It was critical. We, we had to. Good. Um, Bill, a uh, question that I have for you, um, you know, you're still a very young man, but you have a lot of experience behind you. You know, throughout your experience, how does this period of time compare to prior oil and gas industry downturns? Drastically different. Um, and I, I, I have all the confidence in what I'm saying because I, I I grew up south of Houston, um, frankly, in the middle of an oil field. Uh, we've been through several, you know, oil and gas downturns, uh, you know, throughout my life. And what I would say due to this COVID, this was not just downturn, this was a cliff. Um, it just fell out, you know, February to March, depending on what, what level of the industry that you're in. And it, was much more, it was a hundredfold more widespread than anything we've ever seen. You know, especially for those of us in the Gulf Coast, we're used to having some oil price fluctuations, you know, production side uh, gets a little on the lean side, but typically when the production side goes on the lean side, that means that the input goods for the refineries is down, therefore your refinery business has an opportunity of staying pretty healthy, if not a little busier than when oil prices are strong. So it, it's, with, with this downturn, it all stopped. And partly, yeah, because of the, the downturn in you know, the oil field, but at the same time, it was the COVID to where the people that wanted to work and needed the work couldn't even get to work. So it, it's been a very, very much more dramatic shift on the, the downside than anything that we've ever experienced before. Um, and I also believe that as we are starting to, I guess you call it normalize now, it seems like the, 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 the getting out of this is a slower process. Um, of, of course, we haven't been insulated. It's hurt our business as well, and we've made all of the adjustments you know, that, that everybody else has. But the recovery from this, um, it, it seems to be tracking on a slower pace. So it, it's been very, very different um, from a severity uh, uh, base. Previous downturns, you'd have industries that stayed strong. You had the industrial sector that supported a lot of us. This hit it all at the same time. Definitely a major impact. Uh, so, Kristen, let me ask you this, you know, based on, on your opinion and, and kind of building off what Bill had just covered, where do you see the oil and gas industry in five years? 
Uh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's definitely been a change. And I think had you asked us eight months ago where it was going to be in five years versus now, it would be fairly different, dramatically different. Um, there's always work being done and um, technology being developed for alternate sources, uh, energy sources, and, and how we use our abilities better. I think with the general industry downturn, which we were already in a down cycle or going into a down cycle, and now with the impacts of COVID, as Bill mentioned, it's going to be a slower progression back to a normal. And with that, um, a lot of owner operators are turning to how do we optimize our facilities? How do we make them run more efficiently? Because we're not going to be able to run at the capacity we did before. Um, the demand is not currently there for multiple reasons. And we've also had to shift um, what our priorities are. And so with having to push out turnarounds, having to change our operating parameters, and, and really taking a, a good look at supply and demand. Um, I know Bill mentioned, you know, typically if you have one sector of the industry down and the other sector goes up, well, during COVID, almost all of it went down, except for maybe chemicals because we were producing components that went into the manufacturing of PPE goods. Um, but, it, but it is an unusual time. And so the shift over the next five years, in my opinion, is going to be um, optimization and developing technologies that can be quick deploy to give us the ability to run our facilities longer with a smaller maintenance program. You know, in, in looking at protective coding projects related to, you know, the current state of the uh, economy and the environment, you know, Vince, let me ask you this. What are the long-term impacts of COVID-19 in relation to protective coding projects on assets? Well, and, you know, where I'm at, um, you know, we, we took the C-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it has delayed operations and maintenance, uh, you know, coding within our facilities. Uh, you know, this is due in part, you know, with the needs within the, you know, the facilities. We, we perform surveys uh, annually, uh, biannually. Uh, we have operations as well as maintenance staff, you know, putting in ad hoc work orders for, you know, repairs as far as codings. Um, we do have a ro robust maintenance coding operation, and when the C-19 or the, you know, the, the pandemic hit, you know, you had to stop and think, you know, how are we going to protect our people, you know, and still our operations? So, you know, with that, you know, we, we base most of our stuff off of DOT FEMSA as far as the regulations to do our surveys. So at that point, we had an executive team that actually met and came up, you know, with a protocol for us. Um, you know, we still have it at our facilities, you know, introduced, you know, any coatings at this point, this, this year. Uh, we're still assessing whether or not we can get that done, you know, prior to the end of the year. But we do require, uh, you know, third-party contractors to submit a C-19 protocol uh, and make sure it's in alignment with the uh, CDC guidance. Uh, we've implemented, implemented, you know, more enhanced hygiene, sanitar you know, sanitization stations uh, throughout the facilities. Uh, so, you know, guys are not having to travel a good distance to, you know, get to the normal locations where they could wash up, clean up. Um, you know, we've mandated the telework protocols, and I'm sure, you know, like, you know, just like this meeting is, you know, web-based meetings to where we can actually contact, go through and actually, a, 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 and kind of look in and see if, you know, if there's some immediate needs out there. Um, you know, the social distancing, face coverings required inside the facilities, you know, when you're working around others, um, this, the wash stations that I mentioned before, you know, we're continuing to utilize the uh, RP1173, the safety management system, principles of plan, do, check, and adjust, you know, continuous improvement to address and, and assess the C-19 protocols. You know, from our standpoint, you know, we're kind of not leading, you know, as far as that, but we're kind of lagging behind to see where the states, the local, you know, government agencies are saying, you know, we're moving to phase three. Well, our company may stay back in phase two until we assess that it's proper to move forward and make sure we have those, 
you know, um, safety, um, you know, in, in, uh, for our, our people and our operations. So now that we covered the, um, the aspect related to protective coating projects, let's focus on, on corrosion related to uh, analysis, study, and assessment. Uh, uh, Lewis, um, you know, as a material scientist, you know, when conducting assessments and testing, what extra precautions do you recommend to take when doing on-site microscopy and uh, corrosion measurements in a, a COVID-19 environment? Well, um, actually, uh, judging um, from my past experience working in the oil and gas industry, I, um, I can tell you that the usual uh, protocol that we follow that, uh, you know, that you have to wear PPE, you know, help, uh, hard, a hard hat and safety goggles, um, gloves and, and, and FRC, that's, that's actually need to be done. But also now you protect yourself from, from the virus. And uh, for all of us that will go to the plant or go to a, a, a building where we don't know anything, we will require to have a mask. And if we are gonna exchange samples, if we're gonna do some, uh, some experiments in the field or some measurements, I, I highly recommend people to wear a mask, a, a mask not only, um, you know, to protect themselves, but also to protect the other people from in, in the field from any potential contamination. And in the past, we we kind of see, well, you know, we talk to people, we get too close to them, and we, we do our work, but now we have that extra uh, layer of protection that we will need uh, not only uh, wearing our PDE, but also wearing a mask and then treating all the samples as, as if they will be contaminated. And I think that's a very, very important uh, change from the pre-COVID-19 to the, to the time that we're living now. Yes, definitely. A lot of adjustments have to be made and, um, and it, it definitely sets up protocols moving into the future. So Drew, let me ask you, you know, how has the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic impacted corrosion control and, and coatings programs? Well, for our group, it really hasn't impacted as much as you would have thought. Uh, uh, we're engineers, we provide support, write procedures, et cetera, and we can do that remotely very effectively. Um, of the about 13,000 employees at Kinder Morgan, only about 5% are working out of an office. So we're, we're, we're able to be productive and manage our assets safely uh, working remotely. For the corrosion control folks, uh, their, a lot of their uh, activities are solo activities, driving out, uh, doing atmospheric inspections, doing cathodic protection measurements, et cetera. So those aren't affected other than, you know, not having to report to an off, directly to an office, just going straight out to the field and doing their work. Uh, we have implemented a lot of uh, changes in how we're managing projects where people uh, are working together. So we've, we've instituted uh, remote safety meetings, uh, remote tailgate meetings, uh, where we have um, activities that require multiple people, for example, to carry things, we're looking at equipment to replace that multiple personnel need. Uh, so the, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic has, has impacted us a little bit, but the combination of the COVID and the oil and gas market conditions are, are really um, uh, the, they're working together and uh, affecting us more drastically than either one would have, would have had on its own. Uh, we are uh, looking, uh, as a pipeline company, we make money by being efficient. So we're, we're not as exposed to commodity prices as a producer. Uh, we get paid to transport, uh, in our case, natural gas from one place to another. And it doesn't matter what the price is, we get paid the same. So uh, that, that would make you think that we're not really affected, but a lot of our customers are in the oil and gas industry and are exposed to commodity prices. So we have, we have some uh, reduced demand, we have some, uh, some liabilities on the balance sheet from folks who, who are struggling financially. Uh, so we are uh, even doubling down on our efficiencies. Uh, we're undergoing a, um, a reorganization to to look for some efficiencies. I don't expect it to be uh, um, uh, uh, able to be huge. Uh, we we don't scale up and scale down depending on commodity price. We we have a 
kind of a steady demand. But we're looking at combining business unit organizations uh, in a number of fronts to to identify redundancies and and to to operate more efficiently. Yeah. So looking at the you know, the current you know, the current market condition related to the oil and gas industry. You know, Tyler, let me ask you this. How does the, the current market conditions now compare to back in April? Well, that's a great question, Jim. And it, it's a broad question, but I'll give you my perspective. Uh, the market's actually stabilizing a lot faster than people realize. And I want to make sure I highlight the word stabilize because I'm not using the word recovery. I know it may seem slow, but the progress is showing significant stabilization of where we could be. Uh, mostly this is due to the authority-based supplementation. So we see that observed in both government policies that come down from the Trump administration. And we also see it from world organizations like OPEX or OPEX+. Plus. If you look at consumption, a lot of y'all talked about consumption. Consumption of petroleum and liquid fuels was around 94 and a half uh, million barrels a day last month in August. It's still about 9% lower than where we were this time last year, but it's actually 11 to 12% higher than what we saw back in April. Um, the production last month also was lowered. Uh, it was actually poised at about 91.5 million compared to the 94.3 in consumption, which is 3 million barrels a day lower than demand. And so that stabilized price is really propped up both by cuts from OPEC, uh, reduced drilling in the United States, and all of this offered reprieve in addition to the administrative policies from the president's office to really look at a strangled inventory and make sure we have benchmark pricing going forward. Uh, in 2021, we'll see it kind of creep back up another 10% back to the 100 million a day for stabilization, but it's looking positive. Uh, I will also say that one unique challenge we'll see that has come up since April is a lot of the major operators will begin to, and some have already started to, putting up assets for divestment. This is going to provide a lot of the major oil companies with liquidity to satisfy budget deficits, uh, shareholder dividends. They can remove low cost operations. They can bundle assets that have abnormal liabilities. Um, that aren't critical to their feedstock or maybe even an asset that has a sensitive asset retirement obligation down the road for abandonment. So ultimately, we'll see private equities already coming into the market. It'll continue to come into the market. We'll see independents continue to grow, taking advantage of the downturn. And those new independents will have a focused bet going forward on market stability. Uh, we'll have some winners. We'll have some losers. But mostly big companies will come out a little leaner and a little more efficient. Tyler, thank you for uh, providing that insight. So let me open this uh, question to the, the panelists as well. You know, what, what's the current condition like now versus April in, in, in your uh, hemisphere or your opinion? No takers? <laughs> Sorry, was, was that an open question? Yes, it is. I open okay. up to the panelists. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, I didn't realize that. Uh, that's my fault. <laughs> I, I can, I can uh, uh, add to that. Uh, basically, in April, like for inspection work, since we're a third-party inspection company, literally all our projects were stopped. We were halted. We couldn't even go into the plants or a lot of these job sites. Obviously, now with a lot of the containment and a lot of these protocols in place by the governments, um, a lot of these plants are opening up. But of course, you know, their budgets or the paint campaigns budgets have been slashed dramatically, but they are allowing people to come in and do um, maintenance and smaller turnaround scopes. But at least there's that actually people going in and out of the plants beforehand. It was just like uh, basically a desert in a lot of these cases. Yeah, I would echo, I would echo what Mike just said was, was a lot of these projects. I mean, every project we were on, we were on about a dozen projects in the plants and, and even offshore, and we got knocked off of every one of them. And, and so when the first, um, when we were first allowed to get back onto these sites uh, in early June, these were pl uh, projects that were already pre-planned, already funded, and, um, and all we had to do was show compliance towards, uh, on, for the COVID standards. And, um, and we, had to add some, we had to add some protocols in order to get back on these jobs such as limit um, all our outside contacts, with, which in, in many cases meant that we had to provide maybe groceries, um, house our guys into a, a single location and, and do some quarantine and, um, depending on the location of or, or what we were doing. But um, those projects that were not 
uh, that that were pre-planned. They all got done. There were quick turnarounds, like Michael was saying, quick turnarounds, and and um, and they're not uh, you know, no one's revealing revealing what they have uh to the end of the year. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot that's out there, but um, we had to show compliance quickly towards COVID in order to get these pre-planned jobs done. Any other panelists? Well, for us, on the cylinder services side, so we had uh, our work came to a screeching halt. So when the lockdown came, that the turnaround stopped in our market in the Houston area. And so that meant our, the demand for our services just ended. <laughs> so we had to basically do a lot of scrambling from a standpoint of how much work do we have in shop? How are we going to keep our employees safe? Um, how, how do we schedule the work and get, the, get it returned back to the customers? Some customers didn't want it back until uh, a little more time had gone by. Uh, how would that affect cash flow? I mean, it was uh, really, really a, a hard, hard uh, ending uh, there in, in April. Very sudden, of course. So um, we, we had to really crawl out of it. Our business is still way, way down uh, as a result of it. And the, and the fall turnaround season is very, 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 very slow for us anyway. So we need it to kick off. We live and die by them. Exactly, exactly. So, Alan, let me go uh, go back to you. You had covered a little bit regarding some of the protocols that you had adopted. Um, can you go through and, and maybe add a little bit more related to safety protocols for your operations? Yeah, we um, um, what we kind of instituted internally was that we had told our guys that look, if you're not feeling well, don't even come in contact with anybody, stay home. And so we ended up paying a lot of half days for guys that weren't feeling well. And, and um, we just didn't want to take the risk of someone exposing not only, um, not only our work team, but even a, a third party inspector or a, or a job site supervisor for our customers. So we were doing, um, we, we, we did not want anyone showing up, um, to work not feeling well and then throughout the day you know having a, a temperature gauge available um, because no one knows when they're going to ru start running fever so yet you know we just made it part of our culture to be checking in and and not to be working under um, um, any conditions where you're not you weren't feeling well but in addition to we started housing our guys in, in hotels instead of allowing them to go back home um, we were providing them with groceries. That way, they weren't, they weren't, they didn't have to feel like they had to get uh, food from a, you know, food from the grocery store, food from a restaurant. Just limiting their 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 interactions with outside people, and then even inside of a plant, um, you know, having one point of contact, forming with the inspector or forming with a job site supervisor, and still maintaining all the safe distances, uh, mask. Um, having all those safe protocols in place, but just limiting um, outside interaction was was real important. And then for the offshore crews, it was about quarantine and prior to leaving out for offshore, we wanted to make sure everyone was um, was well before um, you know get to the heliport or or on a boat. Um, and we had to we had to do a uh, had to do a quarantine. So. That was the main things that affected our operations. And, and I think uh, Vince had um, also had mentioned that uh, san hand sanitizing stations, we provided for our own, our own bathrooms. And uh, again, just a means of limiting interactions. So that was the main ways, Jim. The changes that you've done, Alan, um, is this something that you plan to keep a lot of it moving forward? I, th I think we have to, um, we, you know, we, we have no, there's no solution to, to COVID right now. And so limiting our interactions seems to be the thing that keeps us on the job. It keeps our employees well. Um, we have no reason to, to veer from it at this point. And, um, and it's increased our cost of operating, but, uh, the cost of not operating at all, uh, it, it makes it well worth it. So we, uh, 
we're happy to um, to make those adjustments and 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 our guys are happy they they responded pretty well um you know it's it's the issue of whether you want to work or not work you know it's not a you don't have a choice in this if um if you want to draw that paycheck and 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 you want to continue to work and and um you know if we want to continue to work for the loops or the kinda morgans and and folks on this panel um as as a contractor you've you know you're happy um to make those adjustments yeah adapting and overcoming the hurdles so you know when we look at the the hurdles you know michael let me ask you uh, in in your opinion what are the biggest hurdles to overcome here in 2020 um, one of the things that we have to understand is, is that a lot of these end users, their budgets are obviously slashed or cut. And, um, and from what I'm talking with a lot of these plant owners, this is that 2021 uh, may also be kind of in that environment as well, depending on how, um, how a lot of these economies and how a lot of these uh, plants are starting up or uh, getting more in demand in some, in some cases. Um, we've seen more of a kind of a concentric kind of idea that a lot of these uh, maintenance strategies are going to become more reactive instead of preventative. So uh, as we know, corrosion never really sleeps. So I have a feeling or I pretty much know that a year from now, we're going to get a lot more projects because of a lot of catch up that had to be taken place. Uh, this kind of happened in 2014, but not obviously to this extent where uh, a lot of plants kind of cut back on spending in that case, uh, oil and gas was a little different because oil was like $120 a barrel. Um, another thing is, is that, uh, you know, making entry a lot of these uh, facilities, sometimes I have to sign these waivers or my guys have to sign waivers. It's like signing away your firstborn son in a lot of these cases because uh, there's a whole bunch of questionnaires about where have you been? Some of them have tracking. Uh, we also have an office in Dubai, and uh, they actually will track you on your phone of where you're going to make sure that you're going to, if you go to Dubai or to these other countries, they actually will track where you're going uh, in order for quarantine's sake to make sure you're not spreading COVID. Uh, we've had uh, shops, like one, and since I'm in Houston, uh, there's a nearby shop in Laporte, Texas, which is basically uh, near Deer Park or on the east side of, of Houston. And uh, the whole shop shut down for two weeks because one or two people had COVID and then a lot of them started uh, testing positive. And the whole shop, the coating shop, you know, had to shut down for two weeks. And so obviously my guys had to get tested. I think on average, we're getting tested like almost every month or so just um, because if we're going to different places, you know, especially if we travel commercially, um, it's always better safe than sorry than infecting, you know, the whole office in that regard. And we have a pretty restrict uh, cleaning schedule as well. Um, I did see a question as far as uh, virtual inspections. And um, one of the things that we've had issues with is we've done probably 20 or 30 virtual inspections. And uh, for the most part, most of, pretty much all of them have been subpar, and here's a few reasons why. One of which is the guys that are actually on site doing the inspection or their contractor or fabrication shop, I mean, the best thing they have is like a phone. And, you know, it's not even the latest, you know, iPhone or Android phone. So they're trying to show us the video. And with any kind of pictures, you know, you have to have aperture, you have to have good lighting. And then you have a whole tank. I mean, these virtual inspections can take up to three hours of just slowly going in the tank. And if they have an area which has low light or is out of focus, then you got to stop and wait for it to finalize. And so our virtual inspections have been just kind of um, very tiring in some cases. And so that's kind of becoming the new normal, uh, you know, because of we're going through COVID and we're hoping that, you know, by next year or mid next year, it'll kind of all go away. But for the time being, you know, it is something better than nothing, but at the same time, there's kind of those uh, issues that are still always presenting itself uh, when we do inspection. So there's obviously, you know, point of contact. We're not going into the plants. We're basically going directly to the job site and then we're leaving out to the contractor gates. So there's just a more mindful approach as far as the hurdles that we have uh, this year for inspections uh, in a lot of these places and facilities. Yeah, Kristen, let me ask you, you know, what, what technologies are available that have helped you better operate during the global pandemic? Well, things like uh, Zoom, Skype, GoToMeeting, 
Um, that's definitely helped uh, ExxonMobil as a, a global company. We have sites all over the world that we still have to support uh, during operations. So um, getting a better idea and a more consistent uh, use of some of these technologies that we might not have relied on before or haven't relied as heavily on. Um, one thing that ExxonMobil is doing, like Michael was just talking about, is remote inspection. Um, prior to COVID, um, it, it was nothing for 70% of my direct materials group for downstream to be traveling on the road to our different sites to support inspection processes or in inspection and maintenance programs at any given time. Um, and with the previous down, start of the downturn and then with COVID uh, kicking up in earlier the year, that travel came to a screeching halt. And um, the company realized how much money we were saving into the multi-millions uh, already this year on, on travel alone. But there was still the demand for, well, how are we going to support our assets? Because um, they are still having to do some of these key inspections, even if we, you know, moved turnarounds or, or maneuvered our maintenance program, certain things still had to get done, critical components. So we are currently investigating multiple remote inspection tools and capabilities um, at any given time. I think we're currently evaluating four or five different mechanisms because, as Michael was saying, a, a general cell phone picture is not the greatest. Uh, so we are investigating multiple avenues and technologies um, that can be deployed worldwide in, a, in an instant, basically, to have our Houston or Singapore or Kuala Lumpur specialists available for assistance using those remote technologies. And I don't see that going away even after we return to a more normal um, industry climate after COVID is finally settled down. Um, I think just in the sheer uh, amount of money that has been saved on not having to send people out constantly, um, we're gonna be deploying these remote technologies at a, at a more permanent scale after this, so. It's just amazing to see the amount of uh, changes and, uh, uh, you know, adaption that had to be done by different uh, industries, especially in the oil gas industry. Hey, Drew, let me ask you this, you know, what immediate steps um, did you, were needed to be taken to ensure business continuity with your operation? Well, for my group, um, it, I saw an interesting presentation by the IT, IT department. They had never had more than 1500 people connected remotely at the same time. And day one, of us closing our offices had 5,000 people connected at the same time. So it was really interesting to see that they had the tools in place, they, they were prepared and, and reacted, and uh, there was almost no, uh, not even a blip as far as our internal company communications and communications with our, uh, our uh, supporting uh, vendors and, and regulators were doing um, we're doing regulatory inspections remotely. Um, what, one of the interesting facts, the IT folks installed 200 servers in, in a day uh, to uh, support our need for, for internal collaboration tools. Um, I, I, um, I, I'm not directly involved in uh, a, a lot of the projects. We, we're, we're more of a technical uh, support organization. I, I know that there are other impacts going on in the field now, um, but um, for the most part, it's business as usual. We're, we're doing the same inspections on the same frequencies. Our, our, almost all of our stuff is driven by regulatory requirements, and where it's not, it's driven by policy requirements, and so that there aren't uh, any real uh, changes there about what we need to do to con control corrosion on our pipeline assets. You know, for the oil and gas industry and, and pretty much any industry out there, when you have a downturn in the economy or in that particular sector, industry sector, you mix it on top of a global pandemic, a lot of change is going to happen. 
So Wells, let me ask you, what was the biggest learning that your business, that Bullard, will take forward as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of stuff that I like to call kind of COVID lemonade, like how do we take lemons and make lemonade? Uh, and Kristen was just mentioning uh, with all these virtual tools, so with Zoom and, and other uh, conferencing technology, one thing that we've found is we're collaborating actually really well, especially it's become kind of a great equalizer for those people who were remote before, right? So our sales team in the field, uh, our coworkers who are around the globe, all of a sudden, it's not like 10 of us are in a room and four people are on Zoom. It's we're all on Zoom. And so it's kind of become a great equalizer from a collaboration standpoint. Uh, I think the biggest learning is um, what you can accomplish when you have a singular focus, right? So again, we're in a different uh, space than many of the other panelists, but uh, our focus is on how do we uh, how do we protect as many workers as possible by first protecting our own employees? And it's been just incredible to watch how our teams have been able to work together uh, in order to accomplish that kind of singular focused mission and really uh, do things. As I mentioned, you know, we were able to launch a new product in a matter of weeks. I mean, I wish that was always the case. It's not. Uh, and uh, yeah, so really this flexibility, this being nimble. I think a lot of people have talked about different creative uh, solutions today, things that they've done very creatively. And I think that there's definitely, a, the pandemic has unleashed some creativity in how we engage with people and how we think about problems. And so we're looking to bring that forward as we, as we, as we get out of this eventually. Uh, Dan, let me um, ask you this question earlier in the panel, the, uh, it was mentioned about, uh, you know, diversification and, and, you know, kind of uh, companies kind of shedding some of the assets they have. You know, is there more emphasis on diversifying business as a result of the uh, condition in the oil and gas industry and COVID-19? Uh, absolutely. So we were um, highly dependent on one particular facet within oil and gas. And uh, not unusual for the industries I've been involved in. But what we found is that hey, we cannot continue depending on that in the future. Um, COVID's revealed that, but that was probably true before COVID. Um, we really needed to come together as a team and really come with some clarity of our purposes and our business plan. We had drifted off our business plan a bit, and uh, that brought a lot of clarity back in our, in our business plan that calls for diversification, expanding of services, uh, expanding of markets, uh, with the capabilities were there without disrupting our core customers and core services. So um, it has been, from that standpoint, it's been fantastic, but I don't appreciate the COVID-19 weight gain. I was a skinny man back in March. So, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, that has been a, a real blessing in disguise for us. Um, Ellen, earlier you had mentioned about uh, when you're looking at uh, job opportunities and, and, and future bids and things like that, you know, without, you know, giving away too much information, you know, you know, has there been a decrease in, in the, you know, the, the bids out there and quotes for the remainder of 2020 and what's 2021 looking like right now too? Well, I should, 2020 does not look good. We're not getting a, a whole lot of interest on anything immediate or even for the last quarter. And, and for a lot of us, you know, uh, a lot of us managers, we uh, visibility into the fourth quarter, everybody wants. And, uh, and, and for a con on the contracting end, it's just not, it's not there. Um, having said that though, 2021, um, I've doing a lot of bids for 2021. I've done bids for 2022 and i um, excited about the, about what's coming up, even first quarter 2021 um, seems to really seem to be uh, strong. Um, there's a lot of confidence in, in, in those project managers, uh, those decision makers, those folks that we deal with on the front line of, um, of getting projects done. Um, the, the confidence of, that this project is going through during the first quarter and, and all seems to be real strong. And so we're excited. It's given us it's given us hope because because um, just the lack of activity for fourth quarter, uh, it, it's 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 uh, minimal. 
So look forward to 2021. Amen. Um, uh, Bill, let me uh, ask you this question. You know, you, you have a lot of experience in the industry and obviously supplying um, not only materials but equipment uh, to contractors that perform work. You know, when and how do you see the market conditions uh, changing when it comes to improving? Well, as one of the other panelists said today, there, there seems to be uh, some, some normalizing uh, over the past Yes, you know, six, maybe eight weeks. Uh, so it, it seems like we're at the bottom of the cliff, I, I guess is the best way I can put it. And what we're seeing, you know, in our little microcosm as an equipment supplier, um, we're, we're seeing parts sales uh, start uh, to increase uh, nowhere near what they were, you know, in, in December, January, and February. But we are seeing a, a, a steady increase in our parts sales on a weekly, monthly basis, which, is, which to us is an indicator that somebody out there is going back to work. Um, some contacts of ours that have you know, customers of ours, but also friends that have considerable rental fleets, uh, they're saying that some of their rental equipment is starting to go back on to jobs. Now, you know, my understanding is that's primarily, you know, in the, the refinery side of it. Um, I don't think there's much happening in the offshore world right now, but there's some people are starting to mobilize some equipment. Therefore, they're needing some parts to take that equipment back up to operatable conditions. The CapEx equipment sales, um, I, man, I, I agree with you. Uh, with everybody on the panel, it's really tough right now on new build. Um, there are some large industrial plants that are still progressing, which have our equipment slated for them. But the, the request for quotes on CapEx equipment has been pretty thin. And we, frankly, we project that really to go through the end of this year. Um, there are some indications at the first of the year, you know, January through March, and I hope we're right. Just what uh, was said earlier, we're seeing some interest in some CapEx projects starting out in the first quarter of 2021. Now, beyond that, I'm not even willing to, to, to say what our soothsayers and our crystal ball is, is saying because it, it's so uh, topsy-turvy right now because none of us have ever gone through the cliff that we, we've gone through for the past six months. So this recovery is going to probably, I'm not going to, is more than likely going to be very different than anything we've ever experienced. But there are some indications out there that we're at the bottom. There's nowhere to go but up now. And our revenues are supporting that on a fairly consistent basis now. We hope we're right. Um, we're certainly looking for better times. Well, you figure when you're at the bottom of a cliff, there's really nowhere to go but up, so. Just get a long rope and a grappling hook, let's go. There you go. Uh, Matt uh, Riley, um, I think right now we've got about 30 minutes left to the program. Uh, we should probably look at some of the questions that we had over the chat. Uh, for the panelists. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, questions that you want to pose to the panelists? Oh, thank you, Jim. Yeah, my name is Matthew Riley. I work for Carlisle Fluid Technologies. We manufacture paint equipment such as Banks and Devilbus uh, are two of our most common uh, branded named uh, paint equipment in the protective coatings world. And uh, I am monitoring the chat and there's about 10 questions that I need to get to um, so if you're done, Jim, I could get to those questions and open it up to the panelists. Is, is that okay? Take it away, my friend. All right. So the first question um, was to you, Jim. And uh, the question is that in the, Gulf country, uh, in the Gulf countries, we do not see a lot of uh, SSPC requirements, mainly NACE. What is the importance and advantages of SSPC compared to NACE? 
Well, the uh, very, very good question. Um, the the great news for everyone is that uh, SSBC, the Society for Protective Coatings, and NACE International um, have uh, signed a definitive agreement. We are becoming a new organization. Uh, the name will follow shortly, hopefully in the next couple months, we'll have the name. But we're in the process of, in of integrating both uh, SSPC and NACE into one new global organization. So what's really nice about the new organization, it's going to focus on not only the corrosion, but also the protective coating side. So when we think about it, the surface preparation, coating application, the training of craft workers, but also focus on cathodic protection when it comes to inspection, when it comes to mitigation, and then tackling a lot of the global issues, uh, working with a lot of the local governments um, and also working with a lot of uh, stakeholders out there in the industry. You know, probably we're looking at a combined membership, probably around 40,000 global members and, you know, a lot of corporate members as well. So I think what you're going to see moving forward is you're going to see a lot of um, emphasis by the organization uh, to really work on uh, work with owners to get into specifications, um, but also to help educate the market out there and provide the answers and the solutions that the industry globally is looking for. I, I hope I answered that question properly. Thank you, Jim. Our next question is to all the panelists. And uh, the question is, do any of you feel that there's political pressure that is impacting the present projects that are on hold? Or do you feel that the producer CEOs are waiting to alter uh, to after November elections to release major projects? I'll say from our point of view at Ken Morgan Corrosion Control, we haven't seen any influence of the, the political environment on, on projects. Anybody else want to respond to that question? Uh, I think a lot of it is heavily dependent on where the project is taking place. Um, if you're referring to U.S. domestic projects, there might be a little bit of that. Um, but in relation to release, waiting to release projects till after the election, um, a lot of the projects that have either been halted or we're even in the planning stages to release in 2021 are being more so affected by the current economic more so in my opinion than the election because those projects were already in the pipeline in some level of development. Um, so maybe not so much the election as opposed to the economic recovery coming out of COVID-19 and how quickly that occurs um, based on where the project was going in. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Kristen's saying. So most of what we're seeing, uh, our interface with agencies like the EPA, Bessie, the Coast Guard, those are continuing. They're doing a great job working from home, and their support staff at the administration level with each agency is phenomenal. The, the macroeconomics is more or less affecting the final investment decision or the FID of a lot of projects. So projects getting out of the feed phase to move into procurement or – staging or even something like a right-of-way acquisition that's all on hold but i think we'll see a lot of that start to gain some momentum in early 2021 thank you our next question uh goes to wells bullard at bullard and the question asked is does bullard foresee in the future the ability to pre-make items that would increase lead times for the end user so I think um, so thanks. Um, so I think that maybe maybe you mean to decrease the lead time for the end user. So yes, I mean again uh, in this world of uh, how do we respond to our to our customers and stuff. Yes, I think that we would be interested in doing that. Now we work with incredible channel partners who also have obviously our products uh, on their shelves and available, and so that's really our number one way to get it as quickly as possible to the end users. Um, but we would obviously partner with our channel partners to respond to whatever needs possible. Um, thanks for the question. Thank you, Wells. Our next question is for Michael Yee at RT Consults. 
what is the approach in executing remote inspection of facilities in offshore refineries, pipelines, and its, challenge, and its challenges in getting efficient and reliable data as to maintain the corrosion control program in these periods of the pandemic? Well, I kind of answered part of that um, on my last, uh, I guess, topic, but basically we've had a lot of virtual inspections as of late and um, a lot of the camera quality is, like I said, when people use their phones, it's those, the inspections, we're just not getting much value out of them. Um, so there's definitely a learning curve and also kind of the equipment that a lot of these companies need to have and put an investment in, in order to have more of a capable virtual inspection. Uh, one of the things is that if we're doing a take inspection virtually, they're going around with the camera and it's not focusing. And basically, you can't do a good inspection visually if it's out of focus. So they don't have enough lighting. They don't have a good camera. I mean, we typically want something that is even higher than, you know, HD, like 2K or 4K is typically good when we do live view uh, for a lot of these virtual inspections. So there has to be that kind of taking place. Um, we have been doing surveys, coding surveys in other countries like Israel. Uh, had an inspector there for about a month. And it was quite interesting because he had he had, he actually witnessed a live fire, <laughs> a live fire episode, you know, because they have to practice that in Israel, you know, since their that platform was very close to the Gaza Strip. Uh, but in any case, it's kind of minimizing the footprint of people on these sites, and then having looking at available current technologies in order to kind of stem the demand for inspections. Thank you, Michael. Our next question is open to all panelists. And the question is, does anyone have any insight into if the pipeline construction slash service contractors are able to survive or have a lot of them close their doors? That's a, that's a, that's a difficult question because it, um, so much of, all, of what we do as contractors is, is relationship-based. And obviously the good news is it's DOT, uh, the pipelines are DOT regulated. So at some point, they're still going to be running pigs. They're still going to be testing for anomalies, and those things are going to come up. And, and um, the, 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 the contractor, the pipeline company, that, that relationship um, – is always being tested as with COVID. So if, um, if that relationship is strong, that company's still, uh, still in business and, and, and doing their job. Um, I don't see why, you know, why those projects would not continue. So, um, I would say that there's going to be continued work. Um, it, it'll never go away. It's just, uh, whether that relationship is, is still, uh, is still established. Thank you, Alan. Does anyone else have any input on that question? All right, I'll move on to the next question. This question is to you, Jim, at SSPC. Will this um, event be posted on YouTube or shared with anybody? Uh, yes, it will definitely be um, archived and uh, uh, hosted on uh, YouTube and be uh, made available to everybody. And uh, currently, we're also live streaming it in Asia Pacific, if I'm correct. Right, Matt? Correct. Thank you, Jim. This next question is also to you, Jim. Can we get a good job with only having an SSPC certification? Um, I saw that earlier, and I, I'm, I'm going to take a, a guess it's regarding to the qualification procedures of the SSPC QP program, which is for contractors, uh, blast and paint shops, and inspection firms. Um, the program related to SSPC QP program has been around since 1989, and it, it's a, a pretty a pretty proven uh, program when it comes to contractor qualification, um, but it's not a you know it's not a magic bullet or anything like that. So the what's very unique about each of the programs, and, and I encourage people to reach out to SSPC for additional information, is that we provide uh, as an organization we provide an audit. Um, of the contractors. We actually go and look at process procedures. We look at personnel. We look at 
when it comes to um, decision process, um, inspection, quality, you know, quality uh, control. But we also go and do an active job site audit. So when you think of an, uh, an ISO audit where they come in and look at process procedures, paperwork, there is that element of it for SSP CQP programs, but also on top of that, we're actually going in the field and um, looking and that observing, observing and um, certifying that way. But the program where it's been a big benefit and it, it's starting to really branch out globally where it's more right now North America cent uh, centered is that it is a relationship that the program has between contractors, shops, inspection firms, and the owners that specify one or many of the program requirements in SSPC. So it's, it's been kind of a very strong partnership since 1989. And uh, I, I, like I say, I encourage uh, everybody who wants to have additional information to either reach out to myself or reach out to SSPC to get more additional information. Great Thank question. You. Thank you, Jim. Our next question goes to Michael E at RT Consults. What are the end users looking for in available inspectors? That for lining inspections, evaluations, and the same for exterior coatings. Okay, thank you. I'm assuming this came from Phil Mueller, but uh, one of the things that we want to be looking for for inspectors that we've come across for end users is kind of their work experience. You can't obviously have a paint inspector that has spent most of his experience with just external coatings to do an internal lining or specialty lining kind of inspection. So getting certifications through NACE or SSPC helps in that kind of gap to kind of show that you have the necessary certifications or the applicable ones for what you're doing inspections. And then the second one is kind of, I'm just reverberating from the previous panelists is kind of your reputation and your relations with a lot of these clients that you have. Um, are you responding to emails? Are you uh, simple things like that to, do you have a very good understanding of the specifications? Are you working with the contractor, not working against the contractor? You know, a lot of those things have to come into play so that uh, as, as a, an inspector yourself, you become more of a marketable or uh, more of a, an essential kind of person on the project than just kind of uh, someone that is kind of, you know, just, you know, pulling your thumb out saying it's good or bad. And, um, and that's one of the things or the key takeaways in a lot of these inspections um, as far as in this economy, when things start to get uh, bad to worse, you know, we still are pretty busy uh, despite, you know, the economic downturn because of the fact that, um, you know, these kinds of uh, the little things matter the most uh, to our, you know, clients or end users. Thank you, Michael. Our next question is open to all panelists. And the question is, if the economic uncertainty is causing projects to be placed in a holding pattern, do you foresee all the projects being released at the same time if the economy should recover quickly after the election? Any thoughts or ideas on how an equipment supplier can prepare for the eventual increase when projects are opened back up? I'll make a quick comment. This is Drew Headley. Uh, oversupply in the oil and gas uh, is, is usually not as quickly corrected as undersupply. And so it'll probably take a while and there won't be a, a key uh, turning point. Uh, the election is not going to have a big impact on, on oil prices. And so I, I don't expect there to be an immediate reaction uh, in, in oil and gas for, um, uh, for uh, oil price conditions changing. As far as COVID, I don't expect there to be an immediate uh, change either. Even if they come out with a vaccine that's 100% effective and everybody takes it, it's going to take uh, months, if not years, to, to get uh, everybody uh, inoculated and uh, and have conditions go back to quote normal, uh, even if we do think there won't be lasting impacts from the from the pandemic as far as social uh, norms and and activities. So I don't think there's going to be a sudden rush back to uh, the the market conditions we had before 
uh, oil prices and COVID came in uh, and, and impacted it. I think it's going to be a gradual change, if anything. Thank you, Drew. I'm going to pass the mic over to Joe Canode. I think he has a question. And then Eli at Bullard is going to pop up some poll questions for the audience. Go ahead, Joe. Well, my, uh, my question was just a, a general blanket uh, question to the, to the panelists. Um, Wells mentioned earlier uh, making lemonade out of lemons. Um, some, I'm just curious if anybody else experienced some um, surprising uh, positives out of uh, this, this COVID-19, um, something that will stick with your businesses, uh, your individual businesses, and uh, areas of expertise um, you know, after the pandemic. Absolutely. I would love to comment on that. So um, when uh, March came around and April came around with lockdowns and um, obviously major changes economically for our business, uh, our, basically our activity and volume, uh, initially we did the, um, the obvious. So we looked at cost cutting, uh, increasing efficiencies, changing vendors, things like that for better deals. Uh, but not long after that, uh, by early May, I was thinking I, I, I need to do a lot of soul searching myself uh, because am I the leader my team needs today? Uh, things are different in May than they were in February. And um, I mean, that has a lot to do with direction, clarity of purpose, sense of urgency, uh, business plan, cash flow, right? All those things. And it was a... Uh, uh, I mean, I spent weeks really digging deep uh, into myself and just thinking there's got to be opportunities in here. I mean, tremendous opportunities somewhere. And, uh, and I think we found them. And today, I mean, just a few months later, um, we're clearer on our plan. Uh, the team's on board. There's a lot of excitement about the growth and potential changes uh, in our market and uh, we, we've improved our communication methods. We've improved our onboarding of new employees, how we get people onboarded quickly and embracing the culture. And it's very positive today. And it was not very positive in March, but um, it, it, it's a very, very rewarding time. It's been a miserable time, but it's been a rewarding time, possibly the most um, personally and professionally rewarding period in my career. It's been fantastic. I'll add to that if I may take the time just from, from Schmidt's um, perspective, uh, I'm, I'm going to mimic something that, that Wells said earlier. Um, because of, quite frankly, all of our wings getting clipped um, and us having to learn Zoom and, and all of the other uh, technologies that very few of us, well, at least from my side of it, uh, use on a regular basis. It, it really made the world a, a smaller place. There's a lot more regular interactions, uh, not, not just within the continental United States, but also with us and people around the world. Um, you know, from, from Singapore to Australia to, to Kuala Lumpur, as was mentioned earlier, to the Middle East, there's there's just a lot more face-to-face -face interactions that will have a benefit long-term. Um, aside from that, what we have done as a, a group, and, uh, for one thing, we were very fortunate when this really hit us because we had a, a tremendous backlog that we were able to uh, carry on through a, a large part of the past six months. And that enabled us to really take a look at what it was that all of us needed to be doing in preparation for better times ahead, especially given that we were all available now. Nobody was traveling. And we put a lot of effort uh, into our research and development team, uh, new product development teams, a lot of testing um, Frankly, a lot of videos uh, were that, that we're still learning how to do those efficiently and beneficially for, for the industry. So from just an equipment manufacturer's side, this 
downturn, although it's been extremely painful, I believe is going to make us a much uh, better company here in the very near future to service the industry that y'all are from. Um, we didn't just sit back on our laurels and you know cry and wait for better times. We've been very proactive in developing information and new products to help the, the marketplace when the business does start resuming. Thank you, Bill. Eli, uh, are you on the call? And if so, can you pull up the poll questions to ask the audience? And um, I would suggest if the panelists are okay with it, stick around and we could um, open up the mics to everybody in the audience after the poll questions are taken and the people in the audience can ask questions that weren't asked or covered um, in the chat. I'll leave the poll questions up about 30 seconds each. We're just gonna run through them. Um, there's four of them that I'm gonna post. Uh, essentially at the end, everyone, when we open up the chat to everyone else, just prep to uh, get some questions from the audience live, so. Matthew, we may have one or two more questions in the chat box that uh, you may want to address um, as well. Yeah, I was going to um, open up the audience to unmute their mics after the poll questions and they could ask uh, the questions I didn't get to in the chat because uh, as I was reading the questions in the chat, there was a lot of questions being asked at the end that I wasn't able to get to. Yeah, as you unmute, it looks like uh, maybe Phil Mueller has a uh, has a uh, general question for the panel that may be good. <clears throat> uh, I can unmute Phil now as the questions are going, and we could just go ahead and continue on and keep the flow going. Perfect. Uh, Phil, I'm going to allow you to talk, so please. Uh, you should have availability now. You just have to unmute your microphone. Yeah. Uh. Can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Yeah. Terrific. Okay, that's it. That was my question. No, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is a question, and I was thinking in off the top of my head between someone I know and also you, Drew, that this would be a question for the two of you, uh, Lewis and Drew. Uh, and it's kind of a loaded question, but it was I was I, I, I geared it to get a good dialogue going between all the expertise we have here uh, as it may pertain to a uh, buried pipeline and different anomalies that occur from time to time. And, and basically it's, a, it's about coatings and, and wraps on, on uh, weld repairs of buried lines, wherever they may be. And, and whether it, you know, it has induced CP current on outside corridors down, you know, outside long distance corridors or within plants or even older um, CP beds, you know, anode beds uh, that can work quite well too. And just some of the anomalies, problems, or, or good occurrences that occurred. In other words, I'm just thinking at initiating it between Lewis, you, and, and Drew as to past experiences where bad things happened, you know, when you had the two, you know, the, the CP, maybe, maybe it was over-inducing Drew or, you know, I mean, uh, reversed leads on rectifiers, you know, for whatever reason, I just wanted to open up that discussion as it relates to uh, coatings and wraps or shrink wraps or anything like that. Well, sure, sure. Um, I'm going to be really general and not talk about specific uh, incidents related to the company I work for. So in general, um, uh, if you have an effective coating, you don't have corrosion failures. So if you have a well-bonded, well-adhered coating that's effective, you can't have corrosion. So all of the corrosion incidents that, that we deal with as an industry are related to coating failures. Uh, maybe it didn't have coating in the, in the first place, or, or maybe it had coating applied and, and that coating for, for whatever reason failed. 
Uh, we are managing, in my segment of the industry, we're managing infrastructure that in, in many cases was built in World War II era. Uh, so we're dealing with aging um, uh, infrastructure and we're able to protect, with Cathodic Protection, we're able to protect uh, those assets even though the coating has uh, degraded, protect it just like it's new. So we often will expose pipe uh, from the 1940s and 1950s and the surface will, the, the, the soil side surface will be as good as new. Just, you can see mill marks on it and, and markings. So cathodic protection is, has, is really the reason why we haven't been required to replace our 250,000 miles of natural gas pipelines and oil and gas pipelines in the U.S. Um, and, and that's been a big uh, benefit. In the era that, that our system started to be installed, these natural gas transmission systems started to be installed in the 40s, there, there was not a, a um, consensus that coatings and cathodic protection were required. And it was really some far-seeing individuals, uh, companies and organizations and, and, and people who, who lobbied for putting coatings on, lobbied for cathodic protection, uh, and that's the reason that the, the, these pipelines are in as good a shape as they are today. We have much better inspection uh, capabilities. We use inline inspection tools uh, to, to evaluate uh, pipelines. We have a lot of above ground survey techniques that weren't around. So, so these pipelines are much safer today, even though they're the same pipelines, they're much safer today than they were, than they were back when, when they were built or, or 50 years ago or, or what have you. Um, so, uh, CP is, is not in any sense, um, uh, negative. I mean, there are, there are concerns about cathodic protection. You mentioned overprotection. That's not a likely failure mechanism. It, it could potentially cause some minor coating damage, but in general, unless you have a metallurgical issue, uh, excessive CP is not a significant, uh, cause of failure to pipelines in the industry. Um, you do have concerns about stray current and where you have congested environments, you have to look out for your fellow pipeline operators. Uh, there, there's lots of uh, committees who, whose sole function is to talk about, hey, we're putting in a new ground bed, how's that gonna affect you? Let's do joint testing, etc. cetera. So uh, coatings are an important part of a corrosion management program the, uh, they, you can't have a coated pipeline without cathodic protection because the, the anode cathode ratio will tend to increase penetration rates where you have coatings and no CP. So CP is designed to protect the non-coated uh, areas uh, and they're synergistic. So coatings and CP go together like that. I just want to say uh, a couple of things about that. I have an experience from my oil and gas. Uh, um, two, co two comments. The first one is most of the times the failures on coatings that we have uh, being involved with are basically related to installation and poor surface preparation. Um, it is very rarely that we can say, oh, the coating was bad or the cathodic protection was, was causing the problem. And uh, one of the most, uh, of the latest examples that I can give you on that uh, field is, I was working on like a litigation case in the north of US, and I cannot tell you too many details, but we have a um, um, company that installed shrink sleeves, and uh, after one, one uh, and a half months, some of the sleeves were leaking and caused a, a severe corrosion, and then we, had, we initiated a testing uh, uh, program. And so we basically, to tell you the story short, that what, in, in one and a half years, all the, uh, all the coatings are replaced. Those are 2,000 shrink sleeves replaced for, for a conventional coating. And I'll, again, I cannot tell you the uh, name of the replacement, but the fact is that the, uh, when we did this analysis of the failed uh, code uh, shrink sleeves that were installed poorly, and the new ones, we realized that from time to time, 
the shrink sleeves will allow, will, will have some path for water, especially what, as Drew say, in those areas that you have very wet conditions. So the, the, the shrink sleeves will allow the penetration of the water and we can, we can see, we can measure the interference and the cathode protection will, will basically not arrive because they were, they were uh, the shrink sleeves will basically um, protect you from cathodic protection. But once, once they allowed, they only allowed a limited amount of voltage, which is actually uh, negative or more, more uh, damaging for the structure of the welds. So that's, that's a bad example of that. But that's one of the, the biggest concerns that we have when there is a, a, a wet environment, a poorly made coating, and uh, the cathodic protection that will basically go works against you. One more quick comment, and I know we're out of time. Uh, you, you mentioned surface prep uh, as a common failure mechanism. The most common failure mechanism for coatings that we've seen is improper coating selection. I mean, if you pick the wrong coating to begin with for those conditions, and, and operators like me don't like to point the finger at ourselves, uh, but often, uh, in this case, shrink sleeves in a, in a soil stress environment uh, might be large diameter pipeline might be a high temperature. I don't know any details, but um, maybe they just chose the wrong coating to begin with, and it wasn't an application problem. It was just the not the right coating for the service. Yeah, in this case, was was a combination of the, uh, of the shrink sleeves and the poor surface preparation. Thank you, Drew and Lewis. I'm going to pass it over to Joe Canode for closing statements. And I just wanted to thank the NACE New Orleans chapter for joining us. Um, and I know NACE New Orleans is going to be hosting an event in December, um, their 22nd annual education week. If you would like any information on that, you could contact uh, Charlie Speed at the NACE New Orleans chapter. And, um, Joe Cano is going to go over our next virtual event. And I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Yeah, and thanks again, Matt, for, uh, for helping putting this together, as well as uh, Eli and, and Jim and, and Karen, all the people that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a great event, very successful. Um, our next event, uh, as uh, we mentioned earlier, is going to be a virtual trade show. Um, right now, we have it scheduled for November 11th, but we were just made aware that it may, may have some conflicts with other virtual events out there. So um, to, be, uh, to be announced if we do decide to, to uh, change it. But right now, we have it for November 11th at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, we're going to showcase the latest technology and corrosion control, abrasive coatings, and uh, more. Um, highlighting special promotions from all of our industry-leading companies, including those that are in, in attendance and on the panel today. Um, course, we're going to award another course scholarship um, to, an, to an attendee to the virtual trade show. And um, again, it's free to attend, free to present, um, and, and free to save. Um, we're going to be looking for sponsors for that event as well. So um, just uh, keep, keep uh, us in mind and, and reach out to either Matthew or I to, uh, to, to you know, get more involved if you, if you like that. Um, I want to again thank everyone for, uh, for organizing this event, volunteering as a, as a panelist, and then uh, all of you in attendance. Um, we, we do, we'd be doing this for an empty crowd if, uh, if you didn't attend, so we, we appreciate you attending and, and making this a successful event. And um, with that, I think we're, we're uh, done with our closing remarks, and, and uh, again, thank you for all of our panelists, and we'll try to uh, answer any questions that we didn't get to offline. Thank you, Joe. And one last final comment. There will be a scholarship awarded to one of the attendees, and that will be announced at our next uh, virtual event, the virtual trade show. And the virtual trade show is open to uh, any attendee for free and any vendor who wants to present during that virtual trade show for free as well. So just get with me if you're interested in the virtual trade show event. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.